The educational film that you are about to see looks back over 50 years of medical history to the first operation on the inner ear to, re to restore normal inner ear physiology and to conserve hearing. Georges Portman was the first to conceive and perform such an operation in Meniere's disease. The discussion which takes place later in the film between Dr. Portman, Dr. Shambo, and Dr. Ehrenberg took place in the summer of 1975 at the Abbe de Bonlieu near Bordeaux. You all know Dr. Portman as a great scientist and surgeon, and I would like to tell you some of his accomplishments outside of the field of medicine, which you perhaps may not know. For he was also, he is also a politician, an economist, historian, author, and great defender of human rights. Dr. Portman was born in 1890 and is now 85 years of age. Until two years ago, he had a complete surgical practice both in Paris and in Bordeaux. He now serves as a full-time consultant in both cities, contributing of his vast knowledge gained in 50 years of operating room practice. For, four, for 40 years, Dr. Portman served as a representative of the Gironde region to the French Senate. And for 30 of those years, he was the head of the committee for the budget for foreign affairs. He also served as the French representative to NATO. His great ability as a politician, a diplomat, combined with his stature as a scientist and a doctor, gained him invitations from all over the world to come and lecture, to teach, to participate in discussions, and to carry out diplomatic missions for the French government. As you can see on this map behind me, he has been to countries all over the world, practically every country, and received honorary degrees and memberships in societies in countries on both sides of the Iron Curtain. Dr. Portman served in both world wars and received the Croix de Guerre in the First World War while recovering from a severe case of typhus. During World War I, he also served in Greece, where at one point he was arrested and brought before a firing squad. And fortunately for all of us, there was a last minute intervention by a young Greek officer who knew of his medical and scientific achievements and saved his life. During World War II, Dr. Portman supplied information to the French resistance and at one time was even called to see Hitler when he had some laryngological problems. He very courageously and diplomatically refused to see him. This story was repeated in all the newsreels in France and helped to stiffen morale in the French resistance. After the war, he went to Germany and helped to rehabilitate over 50,000 French prisoners of war. Dr. Portman is truly a 20th century Renaissance man. And besides having written all of these volumes on otolaryngology, he has also written several books on the history of Europe in the 20th century. This one, for example, which was written in 1959 and tells about the um, relations between the countries of Europe after World War II. <clears throat> Every picture of Jay Dodd and conversation piece in his bureau here and in the Abbey contains a personal anecdote and represents a personal contact by Dr. Portman. Dr. Portman has also been a great defender of the wine, the Bordeaux, as a source of longevity and good, good health. And he is also a gourmet and is currently the president of the Chien de Vosisseux, which is the largest gastronomic organization in the world comprising 60 to 70,000 members. He has been a great believer in the links that bind all people together and that science has been one of these links, which links all scientists in an international community. He has been and is a great, gracious, dynamic force for France, the European community, and the cause of science. You have all just been introduced to Professor Portman as a statesman and a writer and as a great person. Uh, I would like to emphasize that Professor Portman should be considered the father of inner ear surgery as he was the first one to perform 
surgery on the inner ear in an attempt to conserve hearing. This was done in January of 1926. This was uh, well before this type of surgery, which is now just being considered as an alternative to medical therapy for Meniere's disease, uh, was accepted. It is now under discussion by many centers and is slowly coming into uh, acceptance. Professor Portman is to be commended for this contribution, but he was certainly well ahead of his time. We are now at the Abbe de Bonlou outside of Bordeaux, France. Professor Portman, Dr. Shambo from Chicago, and uh, myself, Dr. Kaufman Ehrenberg from St. Louis will continue a discussion of the past 50 years and the importance of the endolymphatic sac and uh, the clinical implications. How did you first become interested in the endolymphatic sac? Well, I began in 1920. Uh, yes. I was uh, astonished because uh, the sacrus endolymphaticus was not well known in the uh, normal um, hearing, in the uh, inner ear, uh, ear. And then I uh, began by anatomical study. And during uh, several years, I studied the uh, sacrus endolophaticus in all the vertebrae, in the fish, the brachians, and the, uh, the birds, and, and so and so, and, and the mammals, and the man. And I have seen that uh, Sacrus endolophaticus was present in no animals, in all the series of vertebrae. But my conclusion was, if this organ is so present in all the vertebrae, it is because it has a function, and probably an important function. Because if this organ had not function, it must have disappeared during the evolution of the species. Yes. Then, when I have uh, sure that the sacrus endolophaticus was existing in all the vertebrates, I made a hypothesis. Why? Which function? And immediately I believe that it was probably in the equilibrium of pressure in the fluid of the internal ear. By comparison with the eyeball, it is necessary to have a good equilibrium of the liquid in the eyeball, and I believe it was the same for the internal ear. It is for that I, I did the search to make experiment to verify this hypothesis. I made two experiments, one on animals, and uh, it was necessary to choose an animal in which it was possible to stop the function of the endolophatic sac without uh, trauma, you know, some trauma, without trauma of the internal ear. And I found that in the ray fishes, and I used uh, two animals, uh, Leiobatis pastinaca and the torpedo. This morning we have seen in our yes. session, we have seen the animal in which I made uh, this experiment. As these uh, animals are uh, sacrus endolophaticus, which is placed below the skin of the dorsal surface of the head, this uh, small canal, which is called canaliculus endolophaticus, it was possible to close to make a closure without trauma of the internal ear. And I believe if I close this canaliculus, probably we must have a trouble of tension of the liquid in the internal ear of the fish. It is to say hydro or hypertension. Professor Portman, we are now at the marine laboratory of Acachon of the University of Bordeaux. It was here over 50 years ago that you first performed your physiologic studies of the endolymphatic sac. Can you please tell me why you picked uh, 
the ray for this uh, study and why you became interested in the endolymphatic sac? Yes, it is in 1920, in this place, just at this laboratory, yeah. I made my first experiment about uh, the endolymphatic sac. And uh, I took the film of the operation exactly here on the table. I see the table with the fish. And I chose the uh, ray, the Leiobatis pastinaca, while uh, the endolophatic sac of the animal is open in the sea, on the superior surface of the head of the animal. And it was possible to make a cut ray at the level of the small canal, which yeah. put in communication the uh, labyrinth with the sea. Dr. Portman, this is a uh, torpedo, another yeah. type of elasma brank that you operated on. Uh, how did you become interested in the endolymphatic sac in all animals? Why did you study this portion of the inner ear? I, uh, I took the, this animal, because you see on the surface of the head, there's the opening of the canaliculus and endolymphatic sac. Yes. The small communication with yes. the sea. And uh, I believe that is a best animal for the expert, because it was possible to stop the action of the endolymphatic apparatus without a trouble for the internal, without touch something, without trauma. Yes. You understand? Yes, I understand. And uh, uh, it is for that I, uh, I choose this phrase, Leo Batis Pastinaca, the torpedo. These were very unusual experiments uh, on the endolymphatic sac of the, these fishes. Uh, what results and observations did you make at the time? Yes, I, uh, I suppose that the closure of the canal produced high drops in the labyrinth. And uh, this uh, hypertension, the endolymphatic fluid, must produce in the animal this equilibrium. And I have seen in the aquarium the fish which was uh, disequilibrated and uh, it's not possible to go in a right way was turning and uh, on the horizontal plan and also on the vertical plan. And what's the proof that the high drops in the labyrinth produce trouble of ah, This would be a very interesting movie. I think we will look uh, at your old movie now. Yes. I use a paraffin, injection paraffin canal, and also a cotton. And after, I am seeing the animal, which gives all the signs, all the aspect of this disequilibrium. He could not go in a straight line, was obliged to turn, like if he has a vertigo, or on a vertical plan, it's he was jumping out of the water. Then it was for me the proof that my hypothesis was true. And I made this experiment several times during uh, several years. And the fishes were sacrificed immediately after, one month after, one year after, two years after and to see by microscopic examination the modification by the... Sometimes I have seen that the vertigo was temporary. And when I see, after uh, I take the, the animal, I make section of the head, in this case, the plug of the canaliculus made by the coterie has disappeared. Okay. And there was a proof that when the canaliculus is open again, the function of the internal ear is normal again. And uh, sometimes the animal was uh, with this equilibrium during several months. When I am, I was sure that my hypothesis was uh, proved by experimental animals, <coughs> it was necessary for me to try an experimentation on man.
Professor Portman, your experiments on elasmobranch inner ears and the clinical implications were quite provocative. We redid your basic experiments at the Learner Marine Laboratory. Based on Portman's original experiments using elasmobranch fishes, uh, we utilized the lemon shark, which was readily available to us at the Lerner Marine Laboratory on the island of Bimini. Lemon sharks are uh, continuously uh, swimming and in motion. During the anesthesia, um, the lemon sharks showed a disequilibri disequilibrium during uh, the second stage of anesthesia, which uh, can be seen now. This is the only time um, during the experimental work that any type of disequilibrium was manifest. The third stage of anesthesia showed no such uh, manifestations of disequilibrium. During the operative procedure, the external orifice of the endolymphatic sac can be readily identified by its increased pigmentation. After flaps are turned, the endolymphatic sac itself can also be readily identified by its grayish pigment. It can either be excised or a suture ligature placed around the external endolymphatic duct. After surgery, the experimental sharks were placed in small concrete pens approximately six feet by eight feet. There was no evidence of gross uh, disequilibrium or uh, episode similar to vertigo. Uh, because this was contrary to our expectations, uh, we planned to take these uh, post-operative sharks uh, back into the open sea pens and photograph them in their natural habitat to see if the phenomenon was at all related to the size of the pens. Here in the large sea pens, our tag sharks are swimming uh, quite normally. From below the water, it can be seen that there was uh, no evidence of any dis disequilibrium. These sharks post-operatively, immediately post-operatively, and also observed at six weeks and up to eight months post-operatively, manifest no acute uh, episode of disequilibrium or any problem swimming. We then felt that uh, they have such good visual perception that they may be able to overcome this with their vision. So we inserted uh, black cellulose over their uh, eyes. And here is a normal lemon shark uh, without the surgery. And he shows evidence that he cannot see. Uh, this is demonstrated in several swimming sequences where he continually bumps into things. This is definitely abnormal. Uh, swimming behavior for the shark, but can be attributed solely to his inability to see. The lemon shark also uh, rarely comes in direct contact with another animal, but this blinded lemon shark will touch this stingray, and this is extremely abnormal. We then put these blinders on the experimental animals and put them back in the open sea pens. Uh, there was no difficulty uh, swimming other than lack of visual perception. This particular shark is having great difficulty swimming across the area he wants to because he cannot readily see this net. This is also quite abnormal but is not a manifestation of disequilibrium. Here the shark actually gets caught in the net trying to swim through it. We then tried the experiments using stingrays, which are another form of elasmobranchs and quite similar to the animals originally used by Portman. Here the normal stingray goes up the side of the pen in a quite normal uh, fashion, uh, not due to the experimental conditions. An experimental stingray, having had his endolymphatic sac removed, uh, shows no significant difference in his swimming pattern from the uh, normal stingrays. To determine what a true disequilibrium would look like in uh, both stingrays and uh, lemon sharks, uh, stingrays were given 
ototoxic dosages of gentamicin, uh, an aminoglycoside antibiotic, and um, these stingrays uh, became disoriented as to uh, their position in space. Here's an example of a disoriented stingray who is trying to swim but is literally upside down and is unable to right himself. Uh, this lasts for a long time and uh, was quite repeatable. We then did uh, similar experiments in uh, mechanical destruction of the labyrinth in lemon sharks. Here is a lemon shark that is several weeks after a bilateral labyrinthectomy. This animal is completely disoriented and is quite dependent on tactile stimulation as he swam over the bodies of the other sharks. And here there is no question that this animal is completely disoriented as to his position in space and he is literally swimming in circles. This is a true manifestation of disequilibrium and is the closest uh, thing to the subjective experience of vertigo that we can imagine in a elasmobranch. We never saw such behavior in chronic or acute experimental animals which would uh, suggest they had an acute episode of high drops. Professor Portman's classic experiments on elasmobranch were performed at the marine laboratory at Akashon near Bordeaux between 1920 and 1925. These experimental studies showed histologically that endolymphatic high drops or endolymphatic hypertension was produced. We evaluated these almost 50 years after the original experiment was performed. At the time Professor Portman did these studies, the concept of endolymphatic high drops as a pathologic entity was not known because the description by Hall, Pike, and Cairns was made in 1938. We had the opportunity to reevaluate Professor Portman's histologic material, which was phased, and this showed endolymphatic hypertension. We also performed studies at the Lerner Marine Laboratory on the island of Bimini in the Bahamas using lemon sharks. An example of endolymphatic high drops in the lemon shark is seen here. The right side was always left as a control and the left side was operated. So we have a built-in control. Here the endolymphatic sac was removed on the left side and we have a normal endolymphatic sac on the right side. This cross section has the brain in the middle and the right ear and the left ear. By comparison you can see a normal facular membrane on the right side and a slightly distended one on the left side. In the normal animal we have a facular membrane flap which shows normal epithelium with loose sub-epithelial uh, connective tissue and multiple small vessels. On the experimental side, this same flap is constricted because of pressure. The epithelium does not appear normal. The connective tissue is much more dense and there are fewer uh, micro vessels. Utilizing the scanning electron microscope, this is normal crista ampullaris sensory hair cells. This stereocilia bundle and a normal kinocilium is uh, the normal view for lemon sharks. It is much longer than in higher animals. This, by contrast, is from the operated or left side of the crista ampullaris in an animal in which endolymphatic high drops was produced. You can still recognize the norm, uh, stereocilia bundle, but at the distal end are these globular deformities, which are quite regular. This is evidence of hair cell damage. Whether or not this is reversible or not is uh, not known at the present time, but raises certain questions about uh, whether or not this endolymphatic hypertension and the mechanical effects of this on the sensory hair cells can be reversed. 
we were unable in our uh, behavioral studies to reproduce the abnormal swimming patterns observed by Professor Portman, but more importantly, we have a model in an animal for uh, endolymphatic high drops on a purely mechanical basis and can show the effects on the sensory hair cells of this uh, experimental condition. When I, am, I was sure that my hypothesis was uh, proved by experimental animals, <coughs> it was necessary for me to tie an experimentation on map. Because everybody can do it's not the same between the animal and the man, <laughs> and between the fish and the man. <laughs> so, so big difference, and it's not possible to, to tell that your opinion is true. And then it is uh, for that, and in 1926, I performed, I believe it is the first time in the world, the decompressive operation of the labyrinth by opening of the sacus and donafaticus in a man who has vertigo, very severe, since many years, with deafness. And uh, all the medical treatment failed. And I've, I had the courage, because I was courageous, to try on man this operation. I opened the sacrus and donafaticus by transmastoid way, approach, with a very good success. Vertigo disappeared, deafness was improved, and the uh, hearing was improved. Then the patient was uh, much better, and I followed the patient during many, many, many years, and he was completely cured of vertigo. And it is very interesting to know the profession of this patient. He was a worker of telephone. We were working on the, the field shrinking of the telephone, the telephone uh, wire. He was obliged to go on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he, he was, after the operation, he could take again this profession. Then I had, with this operation, the second proof that my hypothesis of uh, high drops in the many LTC was correct. Animals first, man second. Dr. Shambo, what do you think is the etiology of Meniere's disease? Uh, <clears throat> this has been quite a mystery ever since Meniere first described this disease in five articles in the <clears throat> medical press of Paris about 125 years ago. Uh, many air uh, insisted that these attacks of vertigo, which previously had been thought to be due to the brain, were actually from the inner ear. But he had no idea of the mechanism or the cause. <coughs> uh, Professor Portman's demonstration of a relationship between the attacks of vertigo, the loss of hearing, and the uh, endolymphatic sac uh, has been very well proved by the experiments of Schuchnick. Schuchnick and Chimera were able in the guinea pig to produce uh, histologically the same changes in the labyrinth as we see in, in man, in many years disease. And uh, Schuchnick, who is very slow about accepting new ideas, at first would not agree, but now he, he says, ah, yes, <laughs> there is a connection. And the operations which we have done using the Portman operation with slight uh, modifications, uh, we were impressed with the abnormal appearance of the sac. In the first place, the blood supply to the wall of the sac appeared to be diminished in many of these cases of many years disease. When we opened the sac, the walls were adherent, abnormally adherent. Then we took biopsies of the sac wall, and the histologic appearance was so different from that of acoustic neuroma operations, where we took biopsies. The, uh, there was abnormality of the epithelium 
in the endolymphatic sac. And our conclusion was that Meniere's disease is due to poor function of the endolymphatic sac, inability to absorb endolymph normally. And I agree with you, and uh, I saw my operation when I was sure that uh, the hand drops was uh, cured by opening of the sacrus and monophaticus. I have many experiments, not uh, only in France, but in America, and the uh, guy of Baltimore shows a uh, movie of the lymphatic liquid uh, going from the inside uh, the uh, inner, inner ear to the sacrus and monophaticus. And uh, I think it is very important to have now the microscopic examination you have made. And I am very grateful to you, Mr. Chambaud, a great, great friend, <laughs> and your uh, pupil, your co-worker, uh, to have made the sacus and donafaticus and the apparatus and donafaticus on a new plan. It is to say on the microscopic examination, biopsies, to see the modification of the cells, and particularly of these cells which are so delicate, delicate, you understand? Yes at the level of the cochlear canal, at the level of the posterior labyrinth. Can you tell us what the first reaction was to this new concept of surgery of the inner ear? What was the response when you presented this to your medical colleagues? Yes, it was very funny. It was, it was in, the first, uh, in the first session of the collegium, and uh, Barani was present. And uh, after my presentation, Barani told, but it's not necessary to open the sacrus and the lymphaticus. To treat vertigo, <coughs> I have good result when I uh, separate the dura mater from the posterior wall of the petrous bone. <coughs> then I answer to Mr. Barani, but you make my operation, but you don't know. And you make my operation bad. Because when well, you make a rupture of the canal, when you separate the dura mater from the bone, at the place where the sacrus and lymphaticus is going in the aqueductus vestibule, you rupt and you make a decompression of the labyrinth. Then I think it is better to make an operation, a surgical operation, well performed, like one operation. And after, uh, uh, nobody was impressed, <laughs> and I suppose was a silence during many years. <laughs> In spite of that, uh, I was sure that my, it, my opinion was uh, exact, and I continue. In all cases, in which uh, you make operation, with a good selection of cases, I think it is very important. And my selection is when the patient as vertigo, not cured by uh, medical treatment, all kinds of medical treatment. When the patient has a hypoexcitability of the vestibular apparatus, and when the patient has a hypotony of the sympathetic nerve. And uh, when you have this uh, three uh, question answered, I think you can operate in good conditions. I know uh, Mr. Hoffman from there, he makes the glycerol test. Yes. All right. I think it is a test more. But uh, perhaps it is uh, more indicated for the deafness, for the hearing. Yes, than it is. The mm -hmm. Yes. And now, 
I am very grateful of your school. However, I must uh, tell also that the Japan school was very good for me. And the first man who made my operation were my two. And he gave exactly the same <coughs> result. He modified a little the technique uh, about the fistula. But uh, he had a very good uh, result and he published the result. But it is mostly since the last year, not you, and many others Americans. But you, mostly, Professor Fambo, my, uh, my friend, uh, and you, who make uh, again my experiment to see if I was uh, true, because you're not, not very sure. Uh, you believe perhaps what's not absolutely exact when you make my experiment to verify. But uh, I accept that very well. In science, we must be uh, examined by the other people. And uh, with the great sincerity, sincerity, you, you see that my opinion was correct. And you published that. And you don't put uh, in the background, the man who begin, began <laughs> this uh, treatment. And I am very, very grateful of that, you know. And uh, now, you have opened a new way of research with the uh, electronic uh, microscope, with the examination of the cells and to see that not only the vertigo, but also the hearing. And it was logical. My first operation in 1926, the patient was there from one side. And uh, after the operation, the, 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 the hearing was improved. And it was improved definitively. And he has no vertigo again. But today, we modify our point of view. Because the patient <coughs> come to us because he has a vertigo. The vertigo is the most uh, uh, penible, penible, I don't know in English, the most penible, the most uh, frightful uh, time. When the patient has a great vertigo, we, one, two days with vomiting and so on, so. <coughs> and he go to see the patient for that, not for deafness. And in the evolution of the many diseases, after each crisis of vertigo, the patient is a little more deaf. And after two, three, five years, he's completely deaf, but he has no vertigo. And many people believe that uh, you have a, a union between uh, the deafness and the vertigo, and it is uh, and if you arrive to be deaf, it is the best manner to be cured of the deaf. And I remember at the beginning of my study, some physicians gave quinine to give the patient death very quickly and to, 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 to see the disappearance of the vertigo. And I think they're completely stupid. It was because uh, the deafness and the vertigo was a result of the hypertension of the liquid. It is not because the patient becomes deaf that he has the vertigo disappears, it's because he has hypertension, high drops. Then we must treat high drops. <coughs> and we arrive now in a new part of the evolution of this uh, treatment, of this surgery, is uh, the surgery must be also the surgery of the deafness. It's not only the surgery of the vertigo. And uh, during a great part of my scientific life, in my mind, 
was always vertigo. My publication was uh, surgical treatment of vertigo. No, no treatment of vertigo of Mania C.C. Of uh, deafness of Mania C.C. Surgical treatment of vertigo. And today, we must uh, believe that it is not the vertigo, but also the deafness. And this deafness is produced like uh, Arenberg show with the microscope by the destruction of the cells, the CDA cells. And uh, if we can uh, suppress the cause of the trouble of these cells at the beginning, we can have a recuperation of the hearing. But if you wait, the deafness must be definitive. Then you know we have a difference between the vertigo and the hearing, vertigo and the deafness. We have a surgical treatment for vertigo, a surgical treatment for deafness. And a patient who has a, a slight deafness must be operated of the opening of the sacus and all of that. It is a new idea. And I have a very good story about that. It was just before the last World War. I have seen a, a woman with a big, many of this is big vertigo, is vomiting. And the test shows that was the left side. On the left side, she was uh, deaf, a great loss of hearing. I operated this patient on this side. On the other side, she had a beginning of deafness. The audiometric test showed that was a beginning of deafness. And the day after, begin uh, the war. And after we have five years, six years, with the occupation after the war, it was not possible to see the patient. And I see this patient six years after. I was completely astonished. She was cured with vertigo on the left side. And on this side, she was deaf. She has a great improving of feeling. The hearing was most, most normal. But on the right side, which was not operated, but had a beginning of deafness, she was completely deaf. Mm -hmm. I believe that this uh, observation was a true experiment to see the necessity to make the surgical treatment of deafness and many of disease at the beginning of the disease. Even the, if the patient has no vertigo and can't vertigo. Mm -hmm. I believe it is a, a new idea. And we must put that in the mind of the, of the doctor. Because if you wait a long time, the deafness is definitive because you have shown that the cells are completely destroyed. Yes. You got very good results. Why do you think that for the 40 years or so after your first report, uh, this was not accepted? Um, or no one reported about this? About, about the hearing? About the operation. About the operation, yes, very good result, but we have a great selection of cases, but in almost all cases, the patient was cured of vertigo, and the hearing was good. In all cases, was not completely disappeared, but in many cases, disappeared, and the 50% of cases, you have improvement of the hearing. You have a movie of your original surgical technique done with mallet and gouge and no operating microscope. It would be of definite historical interest to see this old movie. The operation on the endolymphatic sac, which we have used for several years with good results, is based on the fact 
that many vertigos are caused by hypertension of the endolymphatic fluid in the labyrinth. Here we see an endolymphatic sac localized in the thickness of the dura mater, which surrounds the lateral sinus. This lateral sinus is our landmark. We trephine for it, progressively removing bone until we reach the region of the endolymphatic sac, which we find attached to the posterior wall of the petrosal bone, where the canal enters the aqueduct of the vestibule. It is at this site that the sac is opened. Here we see the technique of the operation. After hemostasis has been affected, the landmark of henal spine is sought and the trephine is applied to a square area of one centimeter behind the external auditory canal and below the horizontal line across Hennel's spine. This trephination is affected with mallet and gouge or with the aid of an electrical forceps working in the above mentioned square we are sure of working in a sound part of the mastoid bone. An anterior X-ray has given us information regarding the exact position of the lateral sinus. Where it goes into the mastoid, as far as the lamina interna, which appears to be glossy and in places even bluish. This is the exact part which should be above the lateral sinus. Thus approaching the lamina interna, we find it as shown, perfectly exposed, with a blue tinge that indicates the place of the lateral sinus. It is here that the bone of the lamina interna must be opened to expose the lateral sinus, which is our second landmark as we know that the region of the endolymphatic sac must be found facing it. Here is the exposed sinus. The opening is now enlarged so as to expose chiefly the anterior part of the sinus, taking great care not to open it, which would make it impossible to continue the operation. The lateral sinus is now exposed. We find it blue with a sharply defined anterior boundary and the beginning of the white dura mater, the presinusal dura mater, the presinusal triangle, which is now perfectly visible and which must be simply augmented in order to establish the point at which the dura mater adheres to the bone. Here we find our third landmark. With great caution, very small fragments of the lamina interna are now broken so as to enlarge the presinusal triangle which has been in full view all the time. Thus we attain an unobstructed view of a larger part of the dura mater. All this must be done with painstaking care in view of the proximity of the lateral sinus. Here is the region where the dura mater is exposed under the lancet exactly in front of the lateral sinus, which is seen to disappear in the posterior aspect. Here we probe with the lancet to establish whether the dura mater is adherent, the fact which tells us that we are in the right place. The white dura mater is now perfectly visible, and here, in front of the lateral sinus, we make an incision with a curved bistury. A few droplets of endolymphatic fluid flow out. These may be visible or invisible, dependent on the quantity escaping. This gauze tampon prevents a small hemorrhage and will be removed after 48 hours. Uh, the important thing now, I believe, is the proper selection of cases. I think your selection was very careful, very strict.
which is why your results were as good as they were. Dr. Ehrenberg has asked why there was this long period from your first report until we became interested in this operation. I think it is very simply that you were far ahead of your time. Some people have ideas that are ahead of everybody else, so far ahead that they cannot uh, comprehend them. I think that was the case with the endolymphatic sac. Finally now, we're catching up with you, and uh, <laughs> we're, we're realizing that this is a, the proper approach, and uh, now we will try to develop better methods of selection so that we may operate these cases early to save the hearing, just as you have said. Thank you. I think we are all right you know, in this work. Do you think it's possible to give to the physicians this uh, position to do not uh, believe that only the vertigo must be treated? Yes, but <coughs> most of the patients in our country, at least, do not get to the ear specialist. They're treated by the family doctor or by the neurologist, yes. sometimes the neurosurgeon, yes. and uh, they don't have this concept of high drops. They don't have the concept of the endolymphatic sac. And I think a great deal of education must be done of the medical profession to teach them that this is the way these patients should be treated in order to save the hearing. Then we have a duty. We have a, we have a big job. <laughs> a big job. Yes. Uh, it is very interesting to me that Meniere, in his original classic description of a triad of symptoms, failed to mention the pressure. And in our experience, and I think your experience and yours too, yes. pressure is often the earliest symptom and the one which is most constantly relieved by endolymphatic sac surgery. Uh, pressure, I think we must emphasize to the doctors, is the symptom to watch for. Uh, another uh, interesting comment, I think, is that the surgical technique which is being used varies from place to place. But the essential technique Dr. Portman described 55 years ago, or 50 years ago, which is to uncover the sac and to establish drainage. Uh, we are trying to uh, perfect the technique, trying to improve on it, by inserting a plastic material of one kind or another to uh, maintain the drainage. But the essential technique is still that, that Portman described yeah. many years ago. Yes, uh, about the, it is a question of the fistula, you know? And some uh, surgeons br bring a uh, modification to, to maintain the opening of the sacrus on the I believe it's not necessary, because when I make my operation, I open the sacrus on the and the patient is cured. Exactly like is the fistula must definitive. And I have two explanations. First, we have a filtrating scar at the place of the opening with a knife. And the second is uh, we have this uh, circuit, physiological uh, uh, run, uh, you understand? Circulation. Circulation, physiological uh, circulation of all the uh, this uh, physiology of the internal ear is uh, modified by the hyperpressure. If you disappear the hyperpressure, the high drops immediately, the, new, the normal physiology becomes again. But uh, it was not necessary, in my opinion, to make uh, this modification. But I, not, I am not against. I think it is all right. All modification must be made if the patient is better for polite. Yeah. Because the patient is a king. Uh, <coughs> there is an international uh, project to study 
Meniere's disease, or better called hydrops of endolymph, uh, which will enable us better to early diagnose these cases and to evaluate the results of treatment, both surgical and medical. And I think this international project has so clearly uh, uh, described the future development in this uh, disease uh, as one which is going to be concentrated on the hearing, on preservation of hearing. And eventually we may come to the concept that the conservative treatment of this disease is early surgery on the sac to control it and thus save the hearing. I think it is very important, but uh, I believe it must be very difficult to explain that to the physicians. A uh, big job. Ah, uh, yes, you told, you told it is a big job, I believe also yes. it is a big job. Yeah. But it is uh, our duty for in the future, you know. Uh, it is very difficult to, to, to tell to a patient, you must be operated, because he begins to be dead. Maybe he has not there to go. Because vertigo is a big vertigo. The treatment is for immediately, for now. And the treatment for deafness is for the future. It is a difference, you know. But if an eye doctor told you that you were beginning to lose the vision in your eye and you had a way to possibly save it, there would not be this uh, reluctance. reluctance. <laughs> I wonder why people think uh, this way about hearing. I think there is a big problem in re-educating people that their hearing is very important and that there are operations available on the inner ear for perceptive deafness sure. and to prevent perceptive deafness from progressing. Surely, I think the hearing of the manier is, is very important. Now, it's more important now than before because we have been uh, uh, only uh, on the vertical because the vertigo was a more immediately uh, frightful for the patient. Right. But, but in the future, it is a deafness. Right. Vertigo can often be controlled by many means and very adequately if you want to go to nerve section. And this is not really the problem for the physician. It seems a great problem to the patient because this is what they're acutely aware of. But as physicians, we should be aware that their hearing will deteriorate and that we should make every effort to make them aware of this and to try to prevent the deterioration in hearing. Yes, but I believe all, all, the, all the thing is to, to make the diagnosis of the hyperpression of the hydrops early. Early. Yeah. early. Early as possible. Early, to I make the diag early yeah. diagnosis. I think that... And I believe the glissol test of... Uh, um, that is good, a good method. Mm -hmm. I yeah. don't use, I don't use, uh, but uh, he gave the regular result uh, on uh, 35 cases. He tells that eight patients of uh, glycerol test negative, and in these eight cases, the patient has no result with the surgery. Correct. In the other, good result. Yeah. That I think is typical. I am very glad to see you, uh, and I'm very amiable. You show me my life, which is very complicated life, a long life. And during this life, I was very uh, grateful for the American school. Because uh, many of the surgeons uh, tied my operation with success. I am pleased to tell, uh, like, uh, Chambou, George Chambou, you know, and uh, William Haas, and William Haas, who invited me the last year as guest of honor in Los Angeles is the Barani Society and also she and uh, uh, Aaron Berg or husband uh, who is on board today and Strauss and Spectre and Austin and Paparella and Schuchsnest all have been very comprehensive of uh, my work of my idea and all the scientific uh, life I have uh, pursued during many, many, many years. And I am very grateful to you first and to the American School. Thank you so much. Thank you. Au revoir. Au revoir.